And it's my great pleasure to do the gap and gap with the hook. And we we did talk the new therapies on them, primary hook type of syndrome at once. And yes, you all know him anyway. He's a pediatric pathologist since 1994. And as for them, uh, previous positions include the uh, head of the Master Course of Medical School at the University of Amsterdam, the head of the Dutch Society of Pediatric Pathology. Chair of the ESPN registry, etc. And um, currently he is the uh, 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 of uh, <laughs> Europe. I like and, uh, Yeah, <laughs> uh, and uh, head of the department of And we'll talk about pH. Can I have well, thank you, Max. Um, I feel very flattered to speak for such an audience here. I'm also amazed by the uh, um, organization of uh, Stephanie and Francis, she even provided a very exciting bus trip <laughs> with the local slow speed master stop. It was really fantastic. Um, so, but I think you're all longing for tea and coffee, so let's move on. Uh, I will focus on uh, the new therapies for primary hyperoxaluria type 1, especially the RNA uh, therapies, because there are really some very interesting. Uh, clinical data already available, but I will start with uh, a review of the disease. You're probably you're all familiar with hyperoxaluria, but I think it's important to really understand what problem we are facing, because then you can you can appreciate who, which patient which actually should treat with these very beautiful but very expensive therapies, and who we actually should not. These are my disclosures. Um, well, the primary hy hyperoxylurias are actually um, uh, metabolic diseases, as you all know. It's, it's, they are uh, very rare genetic disorders of the glyoxalate metabolism and all leading to an overproduction of oxalate, which is a completely useless product and only can leave the body by the kidney and uh, it tends to form uh, nasty crystals and destroys the, the kidney. Now you probably know that uh, actually now we know three types of pH of pH of uh, what uh, um, which uh, pH one is by far the most important one and also the most devastating one. Uh, pH two actually my lab think it's not a liver disease at all. It is a more systemic disease and that would ex explain why one of the therapies actually doesn't work. Um, but I will stick to pH one because. Uh, pH three, we don't even do not understand why you get hyperoxaluria due to uh, hunger deficiency. So let's go to the normal metabolism of uh, glyoxalate. Um, is depicted here. We uh, could we think that um, hydroxyproline and glycolate are actually the most important sources of glyoxalate, which is here in the center, and it comes from glycolate. Um, uh, a collagen uh, breakdown and from uh, from diets most probably, and that leads to glyoxalate. And actually, this system, the alanine glyoxalate aminotransferase and the GR, the uh, glyoxalate reductase, are actually the most important system to de detoxify uh, glyoxalate. And in a normal situation, only a very small proportion of oxalate is made out of gly uh, glyoxalate by LDH. Um, so in pH1, um, AGT is deficient or not. Uh, so it's absolutely um, not, a, not there or it is working ineffectively, leading to a, um, uh, a storage of glyoxalate and then leading to uh, a higher production of oxalate, but also leading to a high production of glycolate. And that's why glycolate, a high level of glycolate, is one of the hallmarks of pH1. But if you look at this um, enzyme, uh, glycolate oxidase, in some patients, that, that enzyme is actually so active that it immediately takes away glycolate. So uh, a normal glycolate is no reason not to think of pH1. So we always have to do genetics. Um, Sander of, of my lab uh, found out that indeed in um, pH1 patient gly uh, glycolate is by far the most important source. And that's different from, from normals and maybe also different in pH2 and pH3. We don't know yet. But that's what the, the, the lab of Swinger Fark 
uh, things that actually in pH2, uh, it's more hydroxychloroquine, which is important. But in pH1, it is, it is glycolate. And that's important for to understand and appreciate the uh, working mechanism of one of the therapies. So there are uh, uh, already more than 50 or, or not already more than 70 mutations known uh, causing pH1, either uh, two mutations where the protein is not uh, produced or, or I mean, that's more interesting, the, the protein is produced, but it is inactive. And the most important one is, this, is the last one. It's actually located in the wrong organelle. It has a, mis, uh, a mitochondrial mistargeting. It should act in peroxisome, and that work of uh, Chris Dampier and um, Sonia Fark in, 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 in uh, already for a long time ago found out that that in these patients with these mutations, there's a, uh, actually in this folding of the HET, which leads to the mitochondrial mistargeting, and that by adding uh, vitamin B6. The refolding takes place and relocalization of um, in the peroxisome of HET uh, takes place. And that explains uh, why V6 works. But it's also very important because there are other mutations where actually in vitro there is also a misfolding. And by using other chaperones and especially derivates uh, of uh, B6, you can actually achieve the same success, but it hasn't achieved, uh, been achieved in vivo yet. But this is a really interesting also um, uh, uh, source for, um, for new medication. So this depicts uh, what we now know in Europe on the prevalence of uh, pH1 and pH2. Um, so it's about 80% of the patients in the Oxford Europe database are pH1 and about 10% for each uh, are pH2 and pH3. So we have about 110 patients with pH2 and uh, pH3. Um, actually, we think that the prevalence, which is all in, in the literature, is about one to three in a million. We think due to this, um, uh, I think it's, it's much higher. And especially in the Maghreb countries, it is probably twice or even three times as high. Um, and the most devastating thing about pH1 that in our database, nearly 50% of patients present with end stage kidney disease, with kidney failure. And, um, and then it becomes a very nasty disease, as you all know, you get systemic um, uh, storage of oxalate, um, especially in bones, but also in the retina, in, uh, in vessels and in nerves. And then when you look at the outcome uh, depicted by the, uh, um, um, by differentiated by uh, B6 positive and B6 uh, negative mutation, you can see that even in the B6 uh, uh, positive, um, they have a better outcome, but they, have, but they still end up with end kidney disease when you get old enough. And it's probably by too late diagnosis and under detection. And here you can see in our uh, registry that you can't see it here, but above the age of 18, uh, it's nearly 80% of the patients were in end stage kidney disease at the time of um, establishments. So these were all missed and only diagnosed when they were in dialysis. So what, what uh, did we have to offer um, until recently? A lot of water, and that's really important. Um, I have a family of two, uh, of two uh, women of 45 and uh, 36 years old. They uh, installed a, a, a gastric tube every night and rinsed themselves with seven liters of water. And they have no mutation. They lost their, 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 their system due to hyperoxylase, so they're very motivated. And, and the oldest one still has a normal renal function. And the second one has an EGFR of 60, only with water. As I treat. But it's not always. Uh, even if you start uh, early, it's not always effective. And when you are uh, at the stage of end stage or nearly end stage um, kidney disease, combined liver kidney uh, transplantation is now the recommendation either sequential or combined. 
Uh, if you have a B6 sensitive mutation, consider only kidney transplantation. And now we have the, uh, uh, quite robust data from the Oxford Europe database that it is actually a good therapy in the mutation, the G170R mutation. Um, but um, this is the conclusion, and we have more, uh, especially outside the Western uh, population, there are very few patients who are basic sensitive because there's a need for new therapies. And these are um, actually the new therapies who are now already um, uh, FDA or email, email approved or nearly approved are in the process of it. And these are all um, based on the idea that you should take away um, either the uh, precursor of oxalate or uh, block the last uh, step to oxalate production. And uh, the idea and the way of doing that is to silence the gene of uh, who is responsible for the um, enzyme you want to knock out to reach that, that goal. And actually, ARI interference therapy is a very elegant therapy, and it's based on uh, a biological process in which exists nearly in all eukaryotic cells. Um, um, this uh, a way of uh, gene um, inhibition to control the, gene, the, the um, effect of the gene. And if you if you would make a therapy out of that, you could. Um, really you have a targeted therapy only uh, against this gene uh, and not completely knock out the gene but only silencing the gene. Um, so what is the idea? You produce a double strength uh, uh, RNA which is brought by a factor GALAC into the liver and then um, it goes through, through uh, a lot of processes bound to diaster and then uh, it uh, is made into RNA induced silencing complex, and that binds to the messenger RNA, which has, uh, which is, uh, um, you uh, should make the new the protein you want to knock out. And this messenger RNA is cleaved and um, is destroyed, and the protein is not produced. That's the whole idea. And uh, for this, um, you have to use a factor which is very little specific and that has already been proved in other RNA drugs. Um, and it is, um, it is, has a very high uh, affinity for the hepatocytes. So the first drug is Lumasran um, uh, from an island. And um, it, uh, it, tends, uh, it, it aims to block this um, enzyme, glycolate oxidase, and if you block that um, um, uh, enzyme, then uh, gly glyoxalate will, uh, will, um, will, uh, will not be produced anymore, and uh, glyoxalate will uh, decrease, oxalate will decrease, but gly glycolate will further go, uh, go up. So you will end up with a very high level of glycolate. And that seemed to be very frightening, but very fortunately, there turns out to be a family who has a um, inherited form of geo um, um, loss of function. And um, they have, uh, these, these two brothers, two uh, Arab brothers have extremely high levels of glycolate. We have we have not seen that uh, yet in uh, patients treated with remastering and they have no clinical phenotype. So that was very fortunate. Um, and also in the uh, mice studies, there was no, um, any side effects of the very high glycolate levels that were seen under remastering. And there was a, a, a strong uh, response on the oxygen production. So this is the main, uh, the most important study, um, the uh, RCT performed in 39 uh, H1 patients with EGFR uh, of more than 30. You can see uh, the patient was the breath all over the world. Um, and they had a quite high uh, urine oxalate excretion. The randomization was two to one, so 26 received lumazuran. Uh, the study was performed for six months, uh, subcutaneously injected the first three months every month, and thereafter every three months. 
and the main uh, um, the principal uh, the uh, primary endpoint was the reduction of 24 hours oxygen excretion at once six and here you can see uh, what the response was so there was a 65 percent reduction of um, oxalate that is really uh, I think an impressive result and 84 percent had um, at the end um, more uh, lower than one and a half uh, upper limits of oxalate excretion so a near normalization of oxalate excretion and about 50 percent had a normalization there were no serious side effects only injection side effects and here you can see the um, results of um, the placebo and the run of the percentage in change and the absolute excretion we can see here that actually um, they say it normalizes but over time most of the patients will have uh, just sub, uh, a little bit more than normal uh, oxygen excretion but less than one and a half of the limits plasma oxalate also uh, decreases and these are the 12 months um, outcomes here in red is the those who first got placebo and there are the limacillin, and you can see also after 12 months, actually the uh, effects is uh, exactly the same. Plasma oxalate normalizes, that's what you expect, and the EGFR uh, remains stable over time. So this is what happened to glycolate, and you can see it increases um, um, significantly, but we, have, we haven't seen any signs of acidosis or side effects uh, related to this so far. Um, well, if you are very optimistic, you can you would say that there's also some uh, decrease of clinical disease, um, but you should be very careful in interpreting these data, and that's also very logic with should, such a short um, follow up. But at least there were no, hardly no, uh, no any new signs of kidney stones and um, maybe there's some decrease in nephrocalcinosis. Uh, well, the same occurs for the very young one and that result was even more impressive than in the older uh, patients. Here you can see um, the percentage of change from baseline to each, each visit. And also here, there seems to be an improvement of the nephrocalcinosis score at 12 months. Um, and finally, the study in dialysis patients. Um, these were uh, was an open label of all ages, and the primary endpoint was the change in platinum oxalate, of course, and not in urine oxalate, because I'm not urine anymore. Um, six were uh, still in pre dialysis, and 15 were in, on, in dialysis. And here you can see in red are the pre dialysis patients, in blue are the dialysis patients. and in the uh, dialysis group, there was a 42% uh, reduction after six months of therapy of plasma oxalate, which is quite impressive, I think. And there's also interesting to see what happens uh, over time if you look at plasma oxalate levels before and just after hemodialysis. The green one are the patients who are treated for six months, and you can see that there is a more steady state over time. Well, we have had some data uh, of our own group of um, 48 months of therapy, and actually um, the uh, urinary oxalate excretion was exactly the same over time, and the plasma oxalate uh, reduction was also the same. There was, uh, uh, two, was hardly any stone event uh, during those, only one stone event, and, uh, but we didn't see any change in nephrocalcinosis. What we also did in four patients, we um, infused labeled glycolates and oxalate and glycine to measure, to have a, a measurement of the um, uh, geo blockade. And the idea is um, because uh, oxalate in pH1 nearly all comes from glycolate, so if you would block this and you would give labeled glycolate, you will have a proxy of the efficacy of geo, geo blockade. And these are the results. Um, 
in, in one is before as a baseline and two is on the therapy. And you can see this, we haven't uh, expected this huge difference in response. And you can see there's only in one patient, only 55% uh, reduction of labor glycolate conversion into oxalate. And here it's more, more than 90%. And that's also reflected by the rate of appearance. And if you, and this is interesting, because if you look at the, the end level of, um, of oxalate in these uh, three patients, so the, this blue one, green and the purple one, who has 82 to 90% free, they're more or less the same. And they're about, yes, just be a, a little bit more than the upper level. So about 1.3, 1.5, Upper liver, uh, upper um, limit of um, of oxalate excretion of the normal level. But you can see in the one who had actually the low, uh, a, a quite low baseline uh, level with only fifty five percent reduction, that the rest hyperoxaluria is really uh, remarkable. So. Our conclusion would be, but it's only from four patients, that it is really an inter-individual response on uh, remastered. What does replace liver uh, transplantation? Um, we did a, a small study with the, with the French, actually you're four French people, uh, patients and only one Dutch patient. So I have to be humble here. Um, what, but what we saw is actually um, with a follow-up of at least six months and some of already 12 to 18 months, uh, that's um, actually no signs of oxalate nephrop nephrop nephropathy afterwards. And also in all, here you can see the plasma oxalate course and at month six and month 12, these are actually levels which are normal for the uh, EGFR the, these patients have. So we saw, saw no signs of nephropathy, no nephropathy, but also still not a normalization of urinary oxalate. So that might be that we are too early, but we should be very careful in um, concluding that this is uh, the, the uh, yeah, this is a good option. The second drug is nidoceron on LDH uh, inhibition, and it's 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 so it blocks the final step to oxalate. And if you look at um, where pH two is located and pH three is located, uh, theoretically it should be a therapy for all types of therapy. Um, so these are the, the phase two uh, results of the phase two study in 25 healthy patients and 80 pH one and pH two patients, and there was a 55 reduction, uh, five percent reduction in urine oxalate, and 67 percent had a lower than uh, 1.5 of the upper limit, and there were no side effects. And unfortunately, we also have now the uh, RTT data, and actually it mimics the. Uh, a study with 35 patients, but here there were 29 pH1 and 6 pH2 patients, and that's important. If you look at the results, uh, eight above six, all then uh, uh, relatively normal um, kidney function. They receive uh, each month uh, nidosterone, so that is different from nidosterone, where you can go to each three months uh, therapy. And the main outcome here was the AUC of the reduction of 24 uh, urine oxalate from baseline. And they saw actually uh, it mimics really the Lumestron uh, outcome. So about 65% of patients had um, a lower than uh, uh, 1.3 uh, upper level of normal and of Overall reduction was also about 65%, and 50% had a normal normalization of urinary oxalate. But in pH2, there was no response at all. Um, injection side effects, the same as in the mass was actually the only side effect, and uh, there was a change in, in plasma oxalate with a sharp reduction. And here you can see the uh, urinary oxalate excretion. Actually, it looks maybe a little bit more better than the but we have to, I think, 
um, this really needs uh, a follow-up. So in conclusion, there are actually, lumetrin is safe and very effective. It's effective in lowering plasma oxalate in pH one, it's FDA and EMA uh, approved. It could be a replacement uh, for lip transplantation, I think in selected patients. And the same accounts as we now see for uh, nidotron, it's not approved yet. That's a problem. There is a trial going on now in pH3. Few words about other therapies who are in the pipeline. Uh, Cryptocast LDH knockout it might be more effective than RNA interference because they have seen in the mushroom that actually not all patients have a complete uh, blockade of the GO. Um, so maybe this cryptocast also uh, could, could cause, and I think would be the, the most interesting therapy would be a double knockout of GO and LDH. And um, also some um, uh, she new chaperone therapies are, but they are still in um, a very, very preliminary uh, preclinical uh, investigation. Steenpentol is a well-known drug for uh, as an anti-epilepticum, and uh, actually there's now a phase three study going on with this drug, uh, which inhibits LBHA. So um, there's an indication, I think, for RNA uh, interference in B6 uh, negative patients and severe disease. Um, there's probably should be a very individual individual uh, um, prescription. Uh, Lumetron is FDA email approved, but already the, um, heard from many people that the access to the drug and even in European countries is very uh, different, really different from country to country. Uh, we just have uh, produced clinical practice recommendation for pH and just yet to be accepted for publication and we have um, and we go into our um, recommendations for RNA therapy and it's really uh, a project of 20 people and more than 40 external uh, voters who responded to this. So this is really a European wide um, consensus on how to use at this moment the RNA therapy. This is my team. I also have to thank the people from also Europe and Ergnet, of course. And I'd like to uh, uh, take your questions. Thank you very much. Like questions from the group. So I, I was a bit surprised to see that you got through with that second trial within the Doxiron against placebo. <laughs> And so, uh, why wouldn't it have been, you know, against standard of care already? Maybe it was over in, in a time voice. But, well, um, I think it's of course with standard, uh, care, uh, standard I mean, of care going on. Right. But it's the same in the matter. And so, the, the um, I, I, I need to reword it. I would have it's almost expected there would have been an add on, as you were just um, saying, to the matter. Um, but apparently, they uh, when when done the trial, uh, you may have put it in that. Well, uh, both drugs started. Uh, both companies started. Uh, of course, uh, Dasima started later than than on the island because actually they were the first with Geo and Rock and had to stop that trial, and they were about half a year later, and then the mustard wasn't. Approved yet when they started the, yeah, yeah. Uh, the trials with Nidosuan. It's real, it's a big fight between these companies. Yeah, yeah okay. That are the questions online. No, no questions online. And I think everybody's longing for, for coffee. There's one thing. Okay, so the next speaker of this um, last session is Alessandro Luciani, who was also mentioned earlier um, today. So he's a junior group leader at the Institute of Physiology in uh, Zurich at the um, university. And um, he did his master in Naples and then um, 
um, PhD in Milan, and then he worked in Olivier de Voisla for um, some time as a postdoc. And his work is focusing on endolysosomal um, mechanisms, and he wants to apply them to different diseases, especially kidney diseases. And today he will talk about the methyl malonic acidemia. Okay, thank you so much uh, yes, for, the, for the nice introduction. Well, you, you were right, actually, I was working on uh, endolysosomal compartments, but thanks to this uh, kidney disease, as which we want to call it, uh, and metabolic disease for a while. Uh, what I'm going to tell you uh, uh, today is a uh, new uh, pascal paradigm really from hemoronic acidemia that could suggest a new therapeutic opportunity for intervention. Uh, let me just introduce uh, this spectacular order. So this is a mitochondrial, as you can see, as you can see here. And uh, this is a, a key organ that is responsible for uh, ATP energy production. This is something that we always find in the textbook set biology. And of course, it does also have many, many important roles, such as is involved in uh, metabolic or anabolic or catabolic reactions, is also maintaining urine redox homeostasis. And recent studies has also highlighted other fundamental uh, roles. For instance, the mitochondria can uh, uh, make interaction with the other intracellular organs through the formation of membrane contact sites where the metabolite can take uh, place and be exchanged between organs. And uh, uh, other studies also apply uh, the mitochondria as a signaling hook that toggles the balance between uh, the rival and cell death factors. So all these studies take together uh, are now putting the mitochondria at the center of the regulatory circuits that maintain uh, cellular physiological mysteries. Um, not surprisingly, uh, imbalance in mitochondrial activity who uh, therefore uh, lead to uh, potentially devastating vulnerability to many cell types, causing a broad spectrum of human disease. And such mitochondrial dysfunction can stem from energy uh, defects in the mitochondrial design protein enzyme, as exemplified by here by uh, methyl malonic uh, acidemia. So let me just introduce quickly the disease. I know that you already know about this disease, but actually uh, this disease is caused by uh, inactivating mutations occurring in the gene called methyl uh, malonic coenzyme mutase uh, that is involved in the terminal step of branch uh, chain amino acid and certain lipids. And actually, this enzyme is crucial because it generates other metabolic reactions, metabolites that enter in the Krebs cycle. And uh, once it, those are there, so you have ATP and energy production. And of course, symmetrically speaking, once this uh, enzyme starts to be dysfunctional, you can see the consequence, you can imagine the consequence. We have accumulation of toxic metabolites as exemplified here by methyl malonic acid. So those metabolites start accumulating within a uh, mitochondrial matrix. And as consequence of this accumulation, we have structural and functional defects occurring in mitochondria. And this trigger a pathogenic cascade that cause cellular damage and cellular dysfunction, and affecting, of course, multiple metabolic uh, active organs, including the kidney. Uh, our lab was interested in understanding the mechanism linking the mood deficiency to mitochondrial dysfunction and tissue damage. And of course, if you want to um, uh, improve the understanding of disease mechanism and translate potentially uh, therapeutic targets to the clinic, you need to uh, use preclinical models or several uh, systems that can uh, recapitulate certain aspects of the human disease. And following this uh, conceptual framework, we start using uh, uh, urine, urinary cells derived uh, from patients, and we take the control as counterpart. And of course, we start validating before us uh, approaching uh, mitochondrial network analysis, the metabolic disease phenotype in these cells. As you can see here, 
So those cells do not express uh, the, the enzyme mode. They don't have enzymatic activity. Uh, clearly, uh, the, the enzyme is absent in the mitochondria. So you can see here by this confocal microscopy. And uh, spectacularly, so these phenotypes are reflected by increase of methylmalonic asp in cells. So we were sure that those several systems were perfectly recapitulating the metabolic disease signature. Then we decided to look at the mitochondrial morphology. And uh, in collaboration with the Francesca Diomedica Massey, uh, what we observe is uh, in the methylmalonic acid in cells, so the mitochondria look completely abnormal, and they have a completely disorganized crease as compared to the control cells. And we uh, run other problem say, suggesting and further confirming the presence of abnormal, uh, abnormal uh, mitochondria. Um, in line with these structural defects, we observe that uh, methylmalonic acid in the cells, uh, they have a, an increased number of mitochondria, as you can see here by the monoprot analysis of all the mitochondrial proteins. Uh, and we confirm so this uh, abnormality by looking at the ratio between mitochondrial DNA and nuclear DNA and by performing additional confocal microscopy studies, suggesting that we have the normal accumulation of ATP5 plugged mitochondria. And uh, uh, to make the story shorter, we run additional uh, essay evaluating the function of the mitochondria. As you can see here, so those mitochondria start having a huge problem with the potential. So we measure the potential through this uh, uh, staining with uh, this probe in tretamethylrhodamine that actually accumulate within the mitochondria once they are functioning. And we uh, did also other bioenergetics uh, uh, analysis suggesting that mitochondria are completely dysfunctional, as you can see, by uh, the reduction of all different OCR parameters like basal respiration, ATP production, and maximal respiration. Uh, as a consequence of uh, dysfunctional mitochondria, uh, we observe an increase production of reactive oxygen species, as you can see here by the uh, in-line imaging approach using a bona fide report of uh, mitochondria derived of oxygen stress, and the cells start developing a stress response, so characterized by uh, increasing antioxidant response like SOT1, and they start also producing uh, lipocalin food. So that is a, a, a well established biomarker that correlates with disease progression in MMA patients. So actually, we were able to uh, validate, so we were able to um, delineate so all the metabolic and mitochondrial defects that occur in MMA uh, patients. Uh, of course, we. Um, we try also to mimic uh, this metabolic mitochondrial dysfunction by looking at mouse model. And in collaboration with Matthias Borgnarda, we had access to uh, mice expressing a knock-in allele that corresponded to a, a known patient mutation, as you can see here. This is the distance mutation, and knockout allele. And those data suggest uh, exactly uh, the same phenotypes that we have serving in cells. So essentially, the mitochondria look morphology of the uh, They start, they uh, have a, a collapse in the um, uh, mitochondrial memory potential, and they start producing mitochondrial loss. We were not so happy at that time, and then we decided to move back to uh, in vivo and start looking at the consequence of the multi-efficiency in vivo. And for uh, for validating this, uh, this concept, we take use of a zebrafish model. Uh, we use a FIPS cast technology, and uh, actually, what we targeted was uh, the exon 3. We introduced through this approach a premature stop codon that results in the uh, premature stop codon within exon 3, uh, leading to a truncated protein that is deprived of enzymatic activity. And as you can see here, so we select one mutant line which looked uh, normal and do not display any, any, any developmental delay. Uh, but we were able to observe an increase of methylmalonic acidemia, the metabolite that accumulates within the enemy patients. 
And this uh, increase was uh, completely abolished by uh, re-expressing the, uh, the wild type enzyme in the liver. So suggesting the specificity of the gene deletion. So then we look at the mitochondrial phenotypes and mitochondrial pathology in the, in the fish. And uh, uh, we went back to the liver and kidney, the, the main target, organ target of the disease, and we look uh, at the mitochondrial morphology. And uh, once again, we observe a large mitochondria with completely uh, disorganized crystal in both liver and kidney of knockout fish when compared to the uh, um, control uh, return rates. Uh, we use uh, CO's metabolic flux analysis to uh, check also the quality of the biogenic profile. And again, we got decrease in the, uh, in the basal respiration, suggesting that the mitochondria are dysfunctional. And then we use a reporter line uh, that express a bona fide report, a bona fide biosensor for mitochondrial oxidative stress. And once crossed back with the mutant line, we observe an increase of mitochondria oxidative stress, as you can see here, by increasing fluorescent sense, uh, fluorescent signal in knockout uh, fish compared to what type of um, Interestingly, we went also uh, at uh, characterization of uh, other phenotypes, and uh, together with Xiong Chen, so we started looking at behavioral phenotypes. And we observe that the knockout uh, fish they uh, swim over shorter distance compared to the uh, compared to the wild type fish, and they start to really die. As you can see here, at, after 14 BPF, you have uh, an excessive mortality of the fish, and those uh, traits were uh, completely <laughs> rescued by feeding the, uh, the the fish with a low protein diet which is uh, currently uh, the standard strategy for the management of the uh, of MMA uh, patients, or by expressing uh, back the war type inside. So we came at the conclusion that uh, the loss of mold uh, enzyme and the resulting accumulation of toxic metabola compromise the homeostasis function of mitochondria, causing epithelial uh, stress and damage. And of course, the answer to the question was uh, how this uh, uh, may lead to the mitochondrial dysfunction. And this was uh, where Sistino, as I mentioned uh, before, uh, Francesco came back to, to us and help us in solving this puzzle. So as you may know, uh, autophagy is a, a bona fide pathway that may selectively uh, remove up to uh, mitochondria to preserve all these things. And why uh, our hypothesis was to, given the accumulation of down in the, in the dysfunction of mitochondria, uh, the loss of mood may compromise the degradation of mitochondria. So uh, to verify this hypothesis, uh, we, uh, to control and MMS cells, we treat them with the rotenone, with the low room toxic release of the rotenone, to induce mitochondrial damage and then their degradation by autophagy pathway. And as you can see here, so um, uh, in control cells, you can see that after 24 hour treatment with rotenum, you, uh, uh, you have a decrease of uh, mitochondrial protein as expected, is indicative of the fact that uh, the mitochondria are cleaned up by autophagy uh, pathway. And we confirm also this data by using the, the mitochondria uh, nuclear DNA ratio. But surprisingly, after the same time uh, treatment, so we did not see any decrease of mitochondrial proteins in the mutant cells. So suggesting that they have defective degradation uh, for the mitochondria. Uh, we went a step farther and uh, make um, cells able to express this reporter that is called mitokina. Actually, uh, this protein, once expressed in mitochondria, allow house to, uh, to deliver, to, to follow up the delivery of mitochondria through the autophagy resonal pathways using uh, <coughs> this spectral shape of fluorescence. So, meaning that once the uh, mitokina is the mitochondria, the so the protein give 
give rise to re uh, green fluorescence. And once the, uh, the mitochema is in the lysosome, so due to acidic pH, so the, the, the protein becomes red. And then we can make the ratio between the red and green signal, and we can use these ratios as surrogate for mitophagy delivery. Okay? So we apply this strategy to our uh, cells, and uh, in line with uh, protein degradation data, we can see that MMS cells display defective delivery of mitochondria to the lysosome, as you can see here. So we don't see the, the shift from green to red. We quantify also, also the signal. And uh, this, this shift did not occur neither under bad condition nor under uh, stressful condition. So uh, take together this data suggests that MMS cells display defective uh, delivery of mitochondria, hence defective mitophagy function. Uh, we went also through uh, to uh, define the mechanistic linking driving the effect of mitophagy. And, 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 <laughs> uh, um, and, and yeah. We went through the mechanism. This so one can we close me. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Just ah, okay. So you went well, yeah. <laughs> We went through the the, to the mechanism uh, driving strategy uh, in MMS cells, and we found that the loss of uh, mood enzyme uh, blocks of the pink mediated recruitment of the party, which is an ubiquity ligase that starts to ubiquity mitochondria proteins uh, to activate the signal, it may signal that culminate with the movement of mitochondria. Uh, within the lysosomal uh, organism. Essentially, this pathway drives the mitophagy uh, completion uh, once the mitochondria are yeah. damaged. And uh, we, uh, we perform different proof of concept uh, showing that if we express pink or express this protein at the mitochondrial level of MMS cells, as you can see here, we are able to increase the recruitment of parking uh, towards the mitochondria. And once the parking is there, we can rescue the delivery as indicated here by the mitochema score, enhance the degradation of mitochondria. So we restore, we normalize the mitophagy pathway after pink uh, one overexpression. And we were able not only to restore the mitophagy pathway, but we improve also the quality of mitochondria. So once we, um, Overexpress pink one in MMS cells, we observe uh, an increase of uh, mitochondrial minimum potential. We restore the mitochondrial redox homeostasis, and we improve also the energetic uh, profile of mitochondria uh, in MMS cells. So we came up to the conclusion that uh, the loss of mood enzyme is the result in the uh, accumulation of toxic metabolite may compromise the pink uh, part in mediated uh, uh, degradation of mitochondria. And this leads to accumulation of mitochondria that start to be dysfunctional and start producing mitochondrial oxidative stress, leading uh, to uh, cellular and epithelial distress, as you can see. Uh, if the mitochondria uh, dysfunction is driving the cellular uh, stress, uh, damage, and dysfunction, then any target uh, um, treatments uh, abolishing or improving the mitochondrial dysfunction will restore, uh, by conceptually, by definition, the, the cellular distress uh, and, and, and damage. And uh, to verify this hypothesis, we use uh, mitochondria uh, targeted uh, antioxidants. So Francesco was mentioning the mitotempo. We use also another one, the Q. And what we did, we treat both knockout fish and patient cells with the mitochondria with those drugs that are currently used also for uh, treatment of other uh, human disease. And were well, used also uh, previously by our lab for treating mitochondrial dysfunction associated with cystic disease. And uh, those are the results that we collect after treatment. 
So the middle Q was uh, efficiently rescued the middle complex of distress, as you can see here by this reporter line and the quantification. We improve this, uh, uh, the swimming behavior uh, phenotype, and we improve also the survival of the mutant, uh, mutant uh, uh, fish. Uh, we went back to the patient sex, and uh, so uh, very nicely we show that the tempo is uh, uh, targeting on mitochondrial oxidative stress, as you can see here. We improve the morphology of the mitochondria in MMSS, we improve the metabolic profile of mitochondria, and we rescue also the uh, damage marker uh, lipocalin 2 uh, in MMSS. So if I have to summarize my talk in just uh, one slide, I would say that I have shown you another link that uh, uh, connects so primary gene deficiency, mitochondrial dysfunction, quality control, care pathways, and cellular damage. I have shown you also the critical role of pig park mitophagy uh, for the maintenance of uh, homeostasis in uh, specialized epithelial cells. Uh, I show you the power of uh, zebrafish as a new tool for uh, drug discovery and development pipelines. And uh, I have shown you also that uh, the use of mitochondrial target antioxidant may restore uh, the mitochondrial function in stages in uh, preclinical models of MMA. And actually what we are looking at in our lab is to uh, potency to enhance mitophagy and test this strategy as a novel therapeutic tool for MMA disease. So with this line, I would like to close my talk and thank all the collaborators in particular, the voice lab, so Marie, she's also here, and uh, uh, Zion and uh, Anke and other international collaborators and funding. And I thank you for your attention. I'm happy to your question. Well, thank you, Alessandro, and, and also thanks for keeping on time. Um, so, are there any questions? Well, maybe I start. You, you mentioned the other mitochondrial diseases uh, that there are in humans. Can you suggest this strategy of boosting mitophagy also for the other mitochondria diseases? Or uh, actually, the... actually um, we did a test. We used another primary mitochondrial disease um, associated with deficiency of COX-10 protein. This was a collaboration with American group, and uh, we did not see any difference or any dysregulation of the pathway, pathway, suggesting that probably this pathway could be specific for material malonic uh, acidemia. Yeah. So in this in this um, methylmalonic aciduria, it's it's not just a mitochondrial defect; there's also a problem with the mitophagy pathway. Yeah, actually, uh, yeah, you get points. So it's a uh, uh, I would say the um, double heat uh, approach. So it's like Parkinson's disease. Actually, you have a metabolic dysfunction, and this metabolic dysfunction could intersect the mitophagy and then enhance the threshold for mitochondrial dysfunction against the disease. Exactly what happens with Parkinson's disease. Okay. All right. Thanks. Other, yeah, Francesco. Very complimentary, Alessandro. Fantastic. Also, oh, sorry, there's a sorry. I was thinking in that. Uh, by the way, I, I didn't get. Did you treat your mice with this uh, compound or any other? Yeah. Uh, um... no, actually, uh, we used the zebrafish because of time. And I have to tell you also that the mice, when you look at the phenotype, kinetic phenotype, so they don't have a spectacular phenotype. Uh, this was uh, the Russian produce other uh, uh, animal see. models. Yes. And also another, and if I can make this another question, what do you think uh, all this uh, accumulation of methylmalonic acid will do if you restore completely the uh, mitophagy? I mean, where is it going? I mean, is it... yeah, actually, <laughs> this is something that we are modeling. Uh, with one collaborator in Napoli, the other is in Napoli. So where we are trying to make some in silico predictions that may help us to target some uh, enzyme that can be output downstream 
methane monoline configuration. Then we want to see if those genetic tricks may moderate such the mitophagy uh, defects. But for sure, there is a lot of a lot of work to do. Other questions? No, okay, so then we move to the next. Okay.